Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, as Panos said, I have spent a lot. I spent a lot of time at the BBC. I spent uh, nine years in the United States, starting, running, buying, and selling internet software businesses. I now uh, spend a lot of time writing books, uh, which are sort of about business and sort of not. I spend a lot of time advising businesses of. Um, all shapes and sizes all over the world, mostly very large corporations. Um, but that's a subject we'll go into in terms of how large is a very large corporation these days. Um, most of my business work has been in high tech and software, but I work with probably all the major banks, many, many big financial institutions, some retail institutions, so quite a big cross section of companies. And I'm very interested to see all the different companies that all of you are from or represent. So when Panos asked me to do this session, I chose to do innovation and adaptability um, for two reasons, really. One is because um, I'm, and, and I hope Panos doesn't shoot me for saying this, um, I'm having a lot of trouble with strategy at the moment, which is to say every company I work with is having a lot of trouble with strategy at the moment. And, and the strategy conversations always seem to turn into innovation conversations, and the innovation conversations always turn, seem to turn into strategy conversations, and I'm never quite sure which is which, and I have a sneaking suspicion that they're the same. And everyone says they want innovation, but then they discover that they don't necessarily have the systems to support it. Mm. So innovation is kind of inherently disruptive. So it's kind of interesting that we want to disrupt our businesses, because in a way, everybody dreams of the day when they're just running smoothly, right? So why is everybody trying to disrupt their own businesses? Are they just perverse? Like, I think I'll mess things up this morning. Okay, that's a really good insight. Go on. So you're, you're trying to anticipate what other people might be doing. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Right. Why? Because you want to make sure that you stay in check and stay ahead. Right. So companies are trying to disrupt themselves because they're afraid that if they don't, others will. And um, the language has changed, but the idea is the same. So, it, so we used to, 10, 15 years ago, talk about cannibalizing your market. And the argument was, if you, know, if you don't cannibalize your market, somebody else will. This was when the internet arose and people were deciding, should they go into any sort of um, digital marketing and distribution. Now we talk about disruption. There's a lot of argument about is disruption really disruptive? I'd say just go ask a few employees and they'll give you a really straight answer. But the notion is you may, if you're going to be disrupted, you may as well disrupt yourself before others disrupt you. So can anybody give me an example of that, of a company disrupting itself? Netflix moving from DVDs to online. Yep, absolutely. Very good example. So why were they disrupting themselves? Because you can see that's the way the market was moving and technology was moving and if they didn't, they would become obsolete. Right. Um, you could say that the black cabs in London are disrupting themselves by coming up with Halo, which is an app which means you can call a black cab. Right? Halo actually came to London before Uber did. It was an attempt to preempt the arrival of Uber. So innovation is partly an attempt to, it's partly a defensive attempt to protect oneself against the disruption of new entrants to a market or new technologies in a market. Why else might you wish to innovate? Can I just ask Margaret, sorry, is innovation, does innovation necessarily mean it has to be new, totally new, or is it just different to what's gone on before within that sector? 
So. Well, this, so that's a really interesting question because I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a big rather theological debate going on at the moment, which is exactly to your point, which is if you're just doing the same stuff in a different way, is it really disruptive? Is it really innovation? So are all of you here familiar with uh, the innovator's dilemma? Yes? No, not everybody. Okay. So the innovator's dilemma is a book written, I don't know, 15 years ago by a Harvard-based Mormon professor who was really interested in why innovation is so hard for companies. And probably at the time that he was writing, one of the classic examples of the problem that he was trying to analyze was um, looking at Kodak. Right, so Kodak for years, the brand leader, global brand leader in film and the kind of global brand as term in terms of photography, doing brilliantly. Everybody has their little orange boxes of film. Everybody talks about the Kodak moment, which is the iconic moment in your life, weddings, anniversaries, birthdays, that kind of stuff. Um, and along comes digital photography. Huge threat to Kodak's business. Surprising little fact that actually one of the first digital cameras ever invented was invented at Kodak by Kodak engineers. Kodak is paralyzed or at least unresponsive in the face of this new technology. Keeps thinking people will always want film. And really the company is brought to its knees by its failure to innovate or to exploit the innovation that it has done inside. And so the question which Clayton Christensen posed in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma, was how come when you have the capacity to innovate, as Kodak clearly did, when you have tons of resources, which Kodak did, when you, have, when you dominate the whole market, which Kodak did, how come you get behind? What's the problem here? And he cited lots and lots of other examples. Can anybody think of other examples similar to that kind of narrative? You've lived through them, trust me. Sorry? Xerox losing its copier business to Canon. Xerox losing its copier business to Canon, yep. Sorry? Blockbuster losing out to Netflix, Amazon, all the CD by post distribution and then streaming distribution, yeah. Nokia. Nokia, yeah, great example, losing out to everyone. <laughs> oh, poor little Nokia. And Nokia, of course, you know, the great innovators in mobile phones to begin with. Another example, they're everywhere. Music industry. Thank you, exactly. Right, music industry losing out to Apple and Spotify, of course. Spotify, Pandora, all the internet radio stations, losing out to everybody. Losing out to everybody. And I think really a, a really interesting example, which um, they don't like it very much when I insist that we talk about it, but how is it that Google missed Facebook? How is it that Google has missed social networking lock, stock, and barrel? Right? Ostensibly the most innovative business in the world, full of unbelievably happy, creative people, apparently, so they tell me, <laughs> right? And you know at the time that Facebook was launched, half the Google employees must have been on it. And nobody thought to put their hand up and say, this is kind of cool, we should do this? Really? So, you know, so part of what all of these examples show is first of all, innovation's unbelievably difficult, right? It's very easy to say, well, Kodak was obviously full of boring old white men who were stupid, except really it's not true. And if that were true, then there would only be one example of that. But actually there isn't an industry you can take where you can't find a dominant market player disrupted, destabilized, at least going through some kind of shock when innovation comes 
and attacks its market from outside. The great example that Clayton Christensen uses in his book is around the steel industry. Bethlehem Steel, these gigantic manufacturing titans being disrupted by mini mill businesses. And the question he's posing is, what is the problem here? When you have the people, you have the talent, you have the access to, to market, you have tons of resources, you have all the know-how, how is it that these incumbent, sorry, that these disruptors come and shake your market? And going back to the point made earlier, the big argument now raging in the circles where these kinds of arguments rage is, are the Ubers of the world really disruptive? Are they really innovative? Or are they just doing the same old stuff in a different way? Now, personally, I'm not sure it matters, because if you're a black cab driver, I don't care whether it's innovative, disruptive, or just a pain in the neck, it's certainly going to change my life. But certainly Clayton Christensen and his pals are saying, this is not true innovation. This is simply moving your business from one platform to another. So innovation intersects with strategy all the time because it's fundamental to competitive positioning, which I know you've been looking at. It's fundamental to your place in the market. Why do companies want to innovate? I mean, innovation is incredibly hard. It's really painful. It's very risky. And mostly it fails. So why do companies bother? You've got a great business. Why are you going to innovate? To have a greater market share. Sorry? To have a greater market share. To have a greater market share? To okay. Have greater profit. Generate profit. Okay, because so you think it'll make more money. So you think it will. <laughs> you hope it will, right? Okay. Why else might you innovate? I want to keep this make this list because it's it's a useful checklist to come back to. So why innovate? What does that mean? <coughs> okay. So it's partly to increase, to grow, right? Market share. So sustainability is a kind of interesting idea. Do you mean to be able to continue to grow? Or do you mean just to be able to stay in business? To survive. To survive, OK. And if you didn't innovate, why might you not survive? Because you would, you would become obsolete and you'd be replaced with something more effective or? OK. I mean, the reason I'm asking is I'm not completely sure it's true. I mean, it may be true. <laughs> but. Um, so, for example, if I think of a hotel, for example, or a hotel chain like the Ritz, right, the Ritz is doing pretty much today what it did 100 years ago. Right? It's still a super luxury brand of super luxury hotels for super rich people. And, you know, it may have had to add Wi Fi to its bedrooms, but it isn't fundamentally in a different business. So, so I think there's a, real, a really interesting question about the trade-off in innovation between this, which is, OK, we want to grow, and this, which means, well, actually, maybe people really love us because we stay the same, that actually the Ritz is the Ritz. And actually, if the Ritz decided to be really radically innovative and go down market, we wouldn't like it. So I think there's a question about, and I, and I think this is one reason innovation is so hard, which is how much do you have to change? And do you always have to change? And is there value in your market to your customers of permanence? 
the people who will go back to the Ritz every 10th year for their wedding anniversary or whatever. So I think, I, I, I think, I think that's sometimes true and not always true. I suppose with the example of the Ritz, you might, who knows what they've been doing internally. It's, right. it's a great brand, it's a great location, it's a great right. service. <laughs> but you don't know how they're delivering that service and maybe they've innovated in that space. Okay, I mean, so it's also about staying relevant. Because obviously if they hadn't introduced electric lighting, that would probably not have been a really brilliant or idea. Wi or Wi-Fi, right, okay. So, why else might you wish to innovate? Is it to anticipate customer need or even, tr even better to try and uh, create a customer need? Yeah, so that's this. So, it's again, it's growth. What else? Do you almost get trapped into having to be an innovative company? That's a really great question. You just you're expected to be innovative, and you have to keep on the treadmill uh -huh. of being innovative. Otherwise, why? Because that's I, I mean, I think you're onto something. Why? What is the in? What's the addiction about? Uh, create better profits. Yeah, so but I don't think spend that. Spend your R&D budget, or you won't get one next. <laughs> so, <laughs> actually, you're you're not wrong, right? So if you can look at companies that have, a spe there are quite a lot of companies like this at the moment, they have piles of cash, piles and piles of cash. They don't necessarily have anywhere to invest it where they're going to get much of a return. It kind of pains the executives to give it all back in dividends, right? So they're sort of, well, we better do something with the cash. So that's definitely part of it. But what else is it? Is there something, something about um, if you you have something to talk about? You know, if you don't do anything, you don't have to talk about it really. But if you're innovating and changing, that keeps a sort of trickle of... Okay, so it's a kind of news addiction. So it's about, it's sort of about kind of this. It's about relevance and being fresh. It may just be a marketing cycle, marketing strategy so that you keep grabbing headlines. So reputation. And why does this matter? That, that's going to drive the strategy of the business, isn't it? Or it should do the CEOs. And perhaps if you look at Kodak, perhaps that's where it went wrong. That, that would be a decision from someone at the top about whether to take the risk of change or not. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it's perhaps there's a, there's a tie in there to risk. Yeah. Well, it's the, I mean, I think the thing that's interesting about that is that it's risky to innovate. It's really risky not to. So there's a there's, so one of the one of the things that makes innovation so hard is calibrating the two risks. Right. So if you don't innovate, it's a huge risk that you're going to fall behind. And if you do innovate, what you definitely know is that some of your innovation is going to fail, and it's all going to be expensive. So there's no risk-free option here. Right. Is there a defense of sort of barriers to entry piece of this as well? Is yep. That, like, if I'm doing a lot, a lot of innovation, actually just to go, go somewhere else, it's, it's, it's easier to buy another battle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's seeing off the competitors you can't see yet. Absolutely. So, because in a lot of markets, the, especially nowadays, the competitors may be startups, which means you don't even know who's out there. So, the only way to defend yourself is to be so out there yourself that they can't catch up. Absolutely. Really good point. At the back, yeah. Um, uh, necessary you know, all, all innovation that you mentioned. So, some companies, not necessarily profit, you have a continuous you want yep. to do the same thing better and faster than, you know, to, to have cost leadership. So I've seen many companies innovate for that reason, so they can do the same thing, speak up better and have different ways of doing that. So they're almost innovating to stay still? Sorry, so they're innovating to, st to be able to stay where they are? Okay. Okay, yeah. What about motivational factors as well, to keep people excited as well as attract 
talent within certain areas? Bingo. Yeah, absolutely. How do any of you feel about working for a company that is dedicated to not innovating? Right. Okay. So you go for a job interview and you're told the great thing about working here is that 10 years from now, your job's going to be exactly the same. Okay? So it's great, you're going to have this office, you know, the tea lady's going to be the same, the tea's going to be the same, everything's going to be the same. So once you get on top of this job, it's going to be lovely. Everybody, anybody want to work at this company? Well, people believe that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Is> that <a? laughs> Strangely not. Okay, so this is really interesting because this is what makes that happen, right? You grow a company by growing the people. Companies don't have ideas. Only people do. So if you don't innovate, you can't get the people who grow your business. And this, strangely enough, is not a new problem. Right? People are highly driven by a desire to grow themselves. And to the degree that you feed that, that is your engine of growth. Now, you need other stuff. You need cash and resources and access to markets. But to the degree that you don't have this, you don't get that. So there's a sort of closed loop, which, which is, I think explains your idea about the sort of addiction to innovation, which is if you stop innovating, you stop losing bright people, which means you quickly become irrelevant. So companies, even companies that aren't terribly enthusiastic about innovation, feel that this is something that they must do. They must do it partly defensively, they must do it to keep people, they must do it to keep their reputation, which is how they keep both people and customers. So innovation becomes the kind of centrifugal force that gives a business momentum. Why wouldn't you innovate? So we were talking about the risk, right? That there's a risk of doing it and there's a risk of not doing it. So what are the arguments? Let's play devil's advocate here for a second. What are the arguments against innovation? Expensive. Very, very expensive. Right. But that's okay because we're going to grow, right? We're going to make more money and build our reputation and stay relevant and fresh and see off the competitors. Yes, no? Right. Each new product could move further away from your product heartland and your heartland consumers. Really, really good insight. Hugely distracting. And we'll come back to that. Yeah. So I'm working at the BBC, and I am a part of a team that invents one of the first personal computers. And I go to my bosses and I say, I've invented this fantastic thing. It's a personal computer. Why don't people cheer? It's not the core business. We're not in the computing business. How are we going to get it to market? Who is the market? We get public money to make TV programs and radio programs. What are you talking about? Why do I want to do this? It's a fantastic entrepreneur I once interviewed named Carol Latham, who's a chemist working for BP. And um, in the 80s, just as the PC revolution was getting started, she asked herself a great question, which was, what might impede this growing trend? And she realized that what could impede it, what the gating factor could be, would be heat. That as processing power increases, computers get hot. And when they get hot, they stop working. And so she thought to herself as a chemist, I bet you could invent a material that would diffuse the heat. So she went to her bosses at BP and said, I've had this great idea. We could make this material for diffusing heat. Every, every computer would need it. 
this could be a gangbuster business. And what did they say? No. It's not core, it's distraction. We're not in the computing business. We don't know anything about the computing business. Please go away. What did she do? She left, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Coming back to this point, right? She started a business that changed everybody's lives, right? Because suddenly computers could get really small. Yes, so it's, it's not to say that it wasn't the right choice for BP not to... Well, I think that's a great question. I think it's a really great question, and we'll come back to that, which is how do you know kind of which is the right strategic innovation and which is not? And I think we can look at things like Kodak and say, or, or the music industry, and say these were really bad calls, but I think it's a harder call than it looks. Yeah. Okay, why else might you not innovate? Yeah. Well, it might be in the distracting part, but it often it's counterintuitive. Companies as a certain logic, so mm -hmm. do business, and mm -hmm. often innovation ideas follows market need or consumer need mm -hmm. that is not in tune yep. with the way that companies see themselves. Yeah. So it's a different logic from the way you think. Yeah. Corporations. So, I think of that kind of as a loss of focus. You know, one of the things we appreciate in strategy is with a really coherent strategy. Your whole organization is very focused. Everybody knows exactly what to do. They understand how to prioritize their work every day. And suddenly you've got this other weird thing going on. And every, I mean, even the people who aren't involved in it start to wonder, well, what are we about? You know, to your point, if BP had decided to make, start making stuff for computers, people start thinking, well, what kind of business are we in? Now you have strategic confusion and people aren't quite sure of what they're there for. So focus is really important in a business and innovation, especially if it's radical innovation, could represent a big threat to that kind of focus. Isn't innovation to help society as well? So it's always been a part of you know, moving society forward, there's problems, what can we innovate to remove those problems? Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's something that we haven't <coughs> Yep, so you might innovate because you went into the world to make, you went into business to make the world a better place, and since the world keeps changing, you want to keep improving it. The problems that the world represents, which you might be able to solve, change. Yep. Is that true businesses, though? Because if you look at some of these drug companies, you know, they could, if that was their overriding principle, they could really be giving a lot of these drugs away. I'm not yeah. charging 60 grand for a cancer treatment. That's right. And it lasts you six months longer. So uh, they might say that was their corporate strategy, but is that really their business? Well, that's a very good question. And actually, so, so what that shows is some people, some organizations are in business for different reasons. If, if you're a drug company, and you really had this at the heart of your mission, what would you be working on today? What's the number one public health issue we have today? Thank you. And you'd be doing antibiotics that we haven't built up resistance to, the biggest health threat we face. Current risk you, that operations 10, 20 years from now will be as dangerous as in the 19th century. The cancer won't kill you, the operation will, from infection. But almost nobody's really working on this. But that tells you about pharma, it doesn't tell you about innovation. Why is, why are the pharma companies not innovating in this space? It's not where the fast money is. Sorry? It's not where the fast money is. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> exactly. So it's too long a return. If any. Right? So innovation is incredibly risky. If I'm, go, you know, if I'm going to invent a new antibiotic, I have no idea how long it's going to take me. I have no idea what it's going to cost, and I have no idea if I'm going to succeed. So if I'm going to stand up in front of my shareholders and say, we came into the business to make the world a better place, 
And now I'm now placing an open-ended bet that I can come up with a new antibiotic that I cannot do a business model for because I don't know how long it's gonna, how long it's gonna take, I don't know what it's gonna cost me, and I don't know what I'm gonna be able to charge for it in the marketplace. Do you think my shareholders would cheer? Well, the people who are facing operations might, right? But on the whole, you know, an open-ended bet for a product that you don't know is even going to be profitable, that looks a little iffy. So if I, so if, if I look through a different lens, okay? mm -hmm. so if I look from a private sector into a public sector, yeah. and if you talk about risk, Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, there are some areas where it's just you don't you don't innovate in this way. It's just you just can't you just you wouldn't just take that risk. You just can't do it. You right. Do it. You might innovate in the way in which you structure, or in the way in which you govern, or the way in which you organise. But you mm -hmm. can't innovate with the core what you're trying to deliver because it's just because if you yeah. screw up, you screw up, and you know that there's a massive impact. On mm -hmm. the so it's that. Yeah, huge political risk. And that's not just in public sector, right? There's huge political risk in the sense that you're putting something, people, money, reputation on the line with very little guarantee. So when you say we're going to homogenize and create universal um, social security benefits, which intellectually might be a super smart thing to do, the risk is not just that you don't know how much it's going to cost or how long it's going to take. The risk is also that if it doesn't work, you look like a complete idiot. And, and that's not trivial for anybody. But you're sort of messing with a public good. Yeah, exactly. And in the meantime, you have the howls of pain for people who are being forced to pilot this rather half-baked thing. Most gigantic IT projects fall into this, you know, which is they don't necessarily look innovative because they're doing the same thing but hopefully in a better way. But again, the, the political risks and the financial risks are significant. Why don't you just keep running it the same old way? So there's always going to be a kind of tipping point between actually the same old way is too, la too laborious, it's too expensive, it's politically unacceptable, to be still be you know doing manual work in the 20th, 21st century. So there's always a huge risk that if you don't innovate, you're going to look like an idiot. And there's always a huge risk that if you do innovate and it fails, you're going to look like an idiot. And in the meantime, there are no guarantees. There's another big reason why you wouldn't innovate. Do you have a strategy to be a follower so you could decide that you're... Yeah, the fast follower, absolutely. And there are definitely companies that do that. Probably the, one of the most famous is Zara. So Zara's whole business model is predicated on being a fast follower. It looks at what's really fashionable this month and has it in the stores next week. So their innovation hasn't been designing cool clothes, which is the really risky part, their innovation has been setting up the processors, processes that can say, oh wow, everybody's going for orange, we're gonna crank out a whole bunch of orange clothes and they're gonna be in the high street next week. And actually to be able to do that is phenomenally difficult. And well, having done that has put them in a very, very particular and um, privileged position, if you like, on the high street. Okay, so, so there are lots of reasons not to innovate, and I would say the last one, and this is one that, that Clayton Christensen talks about a lot, is does kind of come back to the culture of an organization, which is if I'm Kodak and I'm gonna set up this big digital unit over here, it's gonna have really different kinds of people in it. It's gonna have really different kinds of metrics of success. It's going to be working in a very different way with different kinds of things. It's probably going to need strategic alliances with different kinds of companies. It's actually 
if I'm really serious about going into the digital film market, it's a completely different business. And in the meantime, I have this really fantastic business, which is the Orange Box film business, and I have to support it, because by the way, it's where all my money's coming from. So I'm hugely invested in keeping this going, and I don't want to set up this other thing that's a completely different animal. And so in the beginning, it just looks like too big a leap, an unnecessary leap, and too risky. And by the time it looks like I ought to be doing it, what's the problem? Somebody else is doing it. So this has led a lot of people to imagine that if you're a large incumbent, you really have to stick to your knitting. And when the innovative disruptor comes along, your only real option is to buy them. Right, because the transition from one to the other is too difficult. And to some degree, that's what a lot of big pharma has decided it's going to do, which is instead of trying to do all the innovation, which is so expensive and risky, it's just going to let the whole infrastructure of startups take all the risk, have all the fun, have its own unique kind of culture attracting very particular kind of risk-loving individuals, and then pick off the winners. Any problem with that? They might not want to sell. Sorry? They might not want to sell. They always want to sell. I mean, <laughs> they actually, they always want to sell for the simple reason that they almost never have the resources to go to market. So what usually, what, not what usually happens sometimes, what can happen is they sell, but that, that innovation, the people that were there to create that, yeah. they leave, they don't stay with the Exactly right. Yeah. So I have a friend in Denver who, um, I've lost track of how many um, uh, pharma startups she's done, but you know, she, the company is, is born, they do the research, they develop the product, they sell the business, she stays for her earn out, she goes, and she does the next one. It's a perfectly viable ecostructure, in a way. Um, what it guarantees is that the pharma company will never have inside it that innovative capacity. They've essentially decided to outsource it. And they, they risk, the strategic risk is, will they always be able to buy what they need? Is it very expensive? And is it always going to be a little bit behind? But of course, the thing is, it is very expensive, but innovation's really expensive. I would say if you look at pharma as a whole, um, I don't know. Do you think it's working or do you think it's not working? I think a good example where it's worked, so not in pharma, is Cisco, mainly because of a case study on that. Okay. So their whole strategy has been around that, which seems to have been successful, but then it sort of paused for a bit. But right. So perhaps, perhaps other industries do it as well. Yeah. It means you can only buy what's out there, right? So if I really did want to make the world a better place and I really did want to buy the company that's innovating in antibiotics, I'd have trouble because I couldn't find any. So to a degree, it means the market limits your choices. You can't buy what isn't out there. So if you have a strategy that says we're here to make the world a better place for our patients, that is significantly constrained by what the market has generated. Interestingly, when I was running high tech companies, um, Microsoft had a slightly different attitude to startups. It used to buy them to kill them. So it would see an innovation out there and think that was a really good idea. We're going to buy the company, we're going to figure out how they did it, and then we'll shut it down. <coughs> What's the problem with that? It's expensive as well. Yeah, but they had more money than God. So. You just, the person who set that business up yeah. on that idea can just roll it forward again yeah. elsewhere. And you, you're constantly playing catch up. And perhaps that thing that you're after is just going to take off before you, you're better off perhaps trying to control it rather yeah. than to kill it. Yeah, I mean, I think, 
Anybody else have other thoughts? Any reason not to do this? Well, part of the value of a company is the relation to the customers. And if you buy it and shut it down, you kind of give that up, don't you? you kind of violate that relation. Yeah, so if you're, if you're promised to your customers we're always going to stay ahead of the pack, mm -hmm. then it might limit your ability to do that. Someone else is, uh, <coughs> sorry, someone else is always going to come up with the same idea. So what you're doing is you're, um, uh, you're just stopping the inevitability. Inevitability, yeah. that's all it is. It does become a bit of a game of whack-a-mole, right? Which is <laughs> you're just constantly trying to shut down these businesses, and there are quite a lot of them. I think the bigger problem, which became clear only after quite a long period of time for Microsoft, is this very defensive attitude to innovation. Um, fundamentally impeded the innovative culture of the company overall. So one of the things that's really striking about Microsoft was its failure to lead in databases, its failure to lead in mobile, its failure to lead and, and, ha and inevitably have to catch up in terms of games, um, its failure to lead in natural language search. So this is, you know, so this attitude to innovation, which is we're just going to whack it, actually meant that they didn't have a very vibrant innovative culture inside Microsoft, which meant that for they had at least 10 years kind of in the doldrums where its own failure to do organic innovation became really embarrassing. Was that due to uh, the size of the company in the end? That once a company reaches a certain size, mm. then innovation naturally becomes difficult for a company to, to undertake because it's under such a you know, managed yeah. kind of structure. It's a good point. I mean, very large companies usually become very bureaucratic, and bureaucracy is rarely highly innovative because it tends to be very hierarchical. And so there's an argument that says as you get companies get bigger, they become more bureaucratic, they become more siloed, and innovation is about um, the collision of ideas in very bureaucratic silos. Ideas gen generally don't collide. Right. And we'll come back to that. So the point really of this, of this discussion is really that innovation, which everybody pays lip service to, is A, really hard, B, really risky, and there are all sorts of very, very, very good compelling reasons not to do it. So on the one hand, you think, well, your market wants it, your customer wants it, you need to be really aggressive in making sure that you're out there capturing new markets, protecting your margin, and so on. And yet, on the other hand, the risks of doing exactly that are pretty heart-stopping. Coca-Cola is a Okay, go on. That's a, you're right. Go on. Yeah, I think they innovated and came up with a different brand of cola and then backfired and they had to be back and go back to the original yeah. business model. And they also have a habit of shedding other initiatives like Virgin Cola and they spend a lot of money yep. taking the competition out. People who know it. Yes. For example. Yeah. And using a lot of sort of legal and market force to do that. Can you think of other examples? behaving in a similar way. Because as you were speaking, I was just thinking about the airline industry, you know, which tried first of all to stop low-cost carriers, then tried to incubate their own low-cost carriers, and then ended up buying low-cost carriers. And that whole kind of narrative, of course, was really expensive. And you say, you look at airlines and you think, well, you know, you have the planes, you have the customers, you have the routes, you have the airports. Why could you not have done that? Why could they not have done that? Yeah. Yeah, this cultural thing turns out to be really, really challenging, which is we have a culture of doing things one way. It's how we selected our people. It's how we decided what color to paint the offices. You know, it's how we designed our logo. It's ev I mean, if it's done properly, a culture is everywhere. And setting up something in complete opposition to it creates enormous confusion and friction. So one of the classic ways that people have thought of dealing with that problem is what's known as skunk works, 
right? Instead of start, instead of buying startups, why don't we set up our own, put it somewhere else to have its own culture, and then if it works, we'll bring it in. One of the classic examples of that um, was Lego. For years, decades probably, Lego struggled with the issue of why is it that mostly it's just boys who play with Lego? Right? There's no, there nothing necessarily gender specific to building bricks, but what they knew was they had a huge market with parents buying Lego for their boys and not a huge market of parents buying Lego for their girls. So they tried to innovate it internally, flopped, did a skunk work saying go off into a field somewhere, have your own funky offices with your own funky culture and come up with something. What happened? Flopped. <laughs> Barbie did exactly the same thing except in reverse. So skunk works are, are, seem like a perfect answer. You know, we're going to fund our own startup and if it works then we'll bring it in. But actually they're really difficult too. Uh, one of the airlines tried to do that as a way of creating a low-cost airline. Mostly screwed it up because they insisted on still on sharing too many back office services. Um, there are a couple of companies I can think of that have done it really well. One is a company called Thermo Electron, which is, I mean, it's the way they've built their whole business. Is you have a great idea, go off, do your own thing. As a Skunk Works project, if it works, we'll bring it back to the mothership. The problem we've had with that pivot with them selecting our business is when you do set up these skunk works and when they do work, yeah. is then integrating them back exactly. into some of the core businesses. Right. And that just creates a massive clash. Right. And then, you know, they're being asked to integrate, follow our processes. And they don't want to. People like, no. Why? I was having fun in my little, pr in my yeah. little startup. Okay. Yeah. So the cultural issues are just enormous. It's really striking to think, you know, the guys who started Twitter met working at Google. Now, they could have built Twitter in Google. I could probably even argue they might have done better to do that. I'm sure Google would have liked them to start Twitter in Google. But that's not what they wanted to do. And actually, it's going to be quite hard if anybody wants to buy Twitter and integrate it. So the skunk work structurally doesn't eliminate the problem. It reduces political risk, because it's over there, it's not really us. It, it reduces the cultural risk until you tried then to do the integration with the successful project. It definitely reduces the distraction risk, which is it's not us, they're over there, don't talk to them. It's still really expensive. So innovation's just extraordinarily difficult. And yet, as you said, right, you have to do it. You absolutely have to do it. If you're in the buggy whip business in 1899 and you don't innovate, you are not in a meaningful business in 1999. Anybody know the average lifespan of a business? I think some five years. <coughs> the, a startup business is, yeah. Very few businesses last longer than a human life. Right? The most successful businesses rarely live longer than we do. So this issue of staying f relevant and fresh is really, really tricky. So one of, of course, one of the great innovations that everybody endlessly, endlessly talks about is um, the introduction of the iPod, right? So after jo Jobs returned to Apple and cleared out all the extraneous product lines and streamlined the company, fired lots of people, reduced a lot of the cash burn, and after he's launched the iMac, which is not that innovative except it's pretty, um, his first really new product is the iPod. How fast is the iPod successful? It's launched in 2001, I think. Maybe 2002. 
It's either winter 2001 or the beginning of 2002. How fast does it take off? I'm thinking of Gareth's six-month window here. There's no risk for getting a wrong answer in this classroom, by the way. It's slow because you need yeah. different parts of the chain that you need to get in place to make it successful. Okay. Anybody else? Five years. Five years. Okay. Anybody else taking bets here? <laughs> Three. Three years. It's not six months. Okay, the iP the, so there's a, there are lots of charts out here, but essentially it's a really classic business case. So if that's when the iPod launches, which is let's say 2001, um, Q4, um, essentially the iPod sales go like that, and that is about 2005. When it came out, um, reviewing the high-tech market at the time, Gretchen Morganson, who's a writer for the New York Times, tr commented, there are no must-have products driving people to the stores this year. Right. Was it an innovation, the iPod? Because? <laughs> Yeah, iTunes wasn't out yet, so it was just an MP3 player, and we'd had MP3 players for about four years earlier. Right. It was a good interface, though, wasn't it? Wasn't the interface quite It was a beautiful piece of design, no question about it. So this is, I think this is, I mean, it's a classic innovation story, but it's a really interesting story. Um, at this point, I think, I don't know. So th if this is the iPod, about the same time, if you look at the PC market share for Apple, I think maybe it's about 3% here. It goes down to about 2.3%. And then this is the point at which Michael Dell says to Steve Jobs that he should shut the company and give the money back to the shareholders. Right? So, so this isn't looking great. This isn't, from a technology perspective, it's not a really new project. Um, the risk is great, obviously, right? Because this isn't going so well. That doesn't look so hot for quite a while. There's a huge amount of patience here, right? And a strong stomach. What happens here, though? You're right about iTunes and iTunes for Windows in particular, which was like a Catholic going to a Protestant church, right? Unbelievable. But what else happened here? <coughs> I'll give you a clue, okay? This is also pretty much the moment at which YouTube launches. What's happening in the eco structure? Video. Sorry? Video. Nope. I mean, yes, but not, that's not the really crucial piece here. Well, the internet has been taking off for quite a long time, but you're, get, but you're getting warm. <laughs> Thank you. Bingo. That's the moment at which uh, broadband penetration in the United States exceeds 50% when you're not working down phone lines anymore. We're not the same old phone lines you know, the old <laughs> modems, right? So this is the point at which downloading music gets really fast and easy, and it mostly doesn't fall apart mid-song. So what's so interesting about this as an innovation structure or an innovation example is there are really two big, well, two big things driving it. One is the ability to look ahead and say, at some point, broadband penetration, which is holding back consumption of multimedia, is going to reach a point where it takes off. Now, I think I, you know, I launched my first piece of multimedia software back here somewhere, right? 
So multimedia online was not new, but the bandwidth issue was a fundamental gating factor. So this is just like the heat thing in PCs, right? There's a gating factor, but it's going to be resolved. Market forces are powerful enough that make it worthwhile for people to resolve it. And when the gating factor is removed, there is a huge moment of opportunity. And so the strategic innovation is saying, what is this huge moment of opportunity? And when we get there, what will we wish we had? And do we have the stomach, the political will, and by the way, the cash in the bank to wait it out? Because by the time this happens, somebody's going to be there. And it better be us. The notion, uh, I have taught entrepreneurship for what feels like forever, but for about 10 years. Um, the notion that entrepreneurs are these inherently risk-loving individuals is, generally speaking, incorrect. And many, many entrepreneurs would much rather develop their idea within an existing organization with the people and resources that are available, often with people that they've known for a long time, like and trust, than go outside and take the huge risk. So I think you know, your question is a brilliant question because it points to the need of people in leadership positions to create a culture in which that is feasible and which Gareth does, Gareth feels very motivated to succeed and wants to succeed but doesn't feel his life will be at an end if he doesn't. And that's a very finely balanced judgment because obviously Gareth's bosses want him to feel he has real skin in the game. They want him to do his damnedest for this new product, but they don't want him, or I hope they don't want him, to be afraid. Why don't they want him to be afraid? Because there are some managements that would say, actually, Gareth, I want you to feel that your life depends on it, and if it doesn't work, you're out, because I think that will be really motivating for you. Plenty of companies do work like this. So assuming it doesn't sound like Gareth does feel his life is on the line, so why might his bosses not wish him to feel that his life is on the line? The, the fear will change his behavior um, for the negative, you know, assuming in most cases. You won't take risks or, or you might even just think, well, I'm, I'm going to start hedging my bets and get my CV out of the market because I'm not going to be around in six months. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're already then distracting yourself from the yeah, he might start paying backhanders to his distributors. He might start doing any, so not to give you ideas, Gareth. <laughs> he might start doing any so, all sorts of things that aren't ethical or appropriate, but why else might he not, why they not wish him to be afraid? Yeah, he's going to hold back the bad news and he's not going to do his best work. There is, not only is there no evidence that people do their best work when terrified, there's quite a lot of evidence that suggests that when people are hugely stressed, they start making really bad decisions. And it's one of the few laws in psychology, called the Yerkes-Dodson law which shows that under conditions of extreme stress with complex problems to, serve, to solve, you will do, you will perform less well. So it's really interesting, this idea of reward for failure, because on the one hand, we say, well, we want to reward failure in order to drive innovation. We're not so enthusiastic about rewarding failure in banks, for example. So it becomes culturally, and from a management perspective, quite a tricky thing about how you convey this idea that yes, try stuff, and if it fails, it's okay. Because clearly, some failures are okay. But on the other hand, in, as we saw in the banks, you put too much backing behind really risky products, and at some point, you're in deep trouble. 
So rewarding failure is quite a difficult message to deliver because you want to reward noble, uh, noble failures, if you like. You don't want to reward insane risk taking. Well, when you start talking about innovation as very measured, calculated risk, does that sound like real innovation? It's like, we're going to be really innovative, but carefully, right? So now you're driving, you know, with your feet on the accelerator and the brakes. So it's really tough, this thing about innovation. So, John. Oh, sorry, yeah, I was just going to, I hate going back to Apple all the time, but the, the, what the, the diagram you drew there, I mean, the, was there a definite anticipation that the 2005, the broadband was going to increase in its, in its yeah. Was that because that was known to Apple at the time when they were when they were producing these products? Everybody could see that it would come. See. But there's something about so your innovation is reliant. The success of it is reliant on the innovation by somebody else. That's sort of symbiotic. So they needed somebody. So if that's the case, are you not? Did they not try and drive the innovation within broadband? No, because that's not the business they're in. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, they might have encouraged their pals, right, at AT&T and co, to accelerate broadband penetration, but AT&T is already hugely motivated to accelerate broadband penetration. So in a sense, they're looking at a trend and they're hoping they can just ride this wave. The sooner the wave comes, obviously the better, as long as it doesn't come <coughs> faster than they're ready for it. So it wasn't happenstance, it wasn't just back. No, 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 it wasn't happenstance. And it was, in some ways, it was terribly easy to see coming. Um, in the sense that you could see broadband in penetration increasing, and you could do a pretty much back of the envelope calculation about what, would, what it would take, how long it would take to get to 50%. Of course, there were economic conditions that could slow it or accelerate it, because obviously it was going to be a premium product, which would um, impact the rate at which consumers took it up. But I think, I think there was a sense that once you have so many millions of people online, what they want is a better experience. And as the experience gets better, that drives appetite. But what I think is so interesting about this, and we'll come back to it, but part of what's interesting is, so this is about anticipating a trend. And a lot of innovation is about anticipating trends. And what's really striking is, so this is a four-year window. And so you can do, in your business planning, you can think, OK, so if this is approximately how long it's going to take, this is, you know, you can do the business model for the iPod and think, OK, if we charge enough for it, we're generating enough cash to wait it out, OK? Um, and you, go, you know, there are a lot of variables in this. You're hoping nobody else is really doing the same. You're definitely promoting the product because you want consumer behavior to start to change in anticipation of it. But you're essentially doing some pretty significant forecasting here. And you're doing it because you think it will pay off. And there is some very sophisticated financial forecasting underlying this, right? Because at the time that this is occurring, Apple isn't a gigantically cash-rich business, although it had always been highly, highly focused on high-margin products, which generates the cash, which gives you some resilience. And on some level, there isn't a huge political risk, because at this point, the one thing you can be pretty sure of is nobody's going to fire Steve Jobs. Okay, so he has the stomach, but he also has the political support to do it. So the innovation isn't random. It's strategic, and it's based on a quite penetrating understanding of the market that they're in. Now, we talked about how little PC market share it had. What was it that meant that these, these numbers didn't really mean anything? Why didn't they matter? All the market analysts thought they mattered. Because the overall market was going to increase 
exponentially. So your market share would shoot up. Well, not your market share would shoot up, but your, the, the, the amount of products you're getting out would shoot up anyway, regardless of your market. Yeah, I think by about here, Rand, uh, the market share is seven uh, percent. I don't know what it is today. I should look that up. But what's so interesting about this strategy, and it is fundamentally a strategy around innovation, is that what Apple ha does have, the only big number here, is it has 99% market share of computers that cost over $1,000. <coughs> it's a high margin business always has been incredibly profitable. So the way people talk about that now is not so much in terms of market share, and we're going to come back to this after our coffee break. They're talking about profit pool. Because if you say, I have 3% market share, that sounds like nothing. But if you think, okay, the profit available to the PC market is this big, I may have a very big chunk of that. And that is how you pay for this long wait in the desert when everybody tells you you're mad. Big deal, an MP3 player. Yeah, it's pretty. So what? Right. So cash and innovation are really critical because most innovative products take longer to take off than you imagine. A lot of in a lot of the entrepreneurship programs that I've taught on, um, there are business plan competitions and everybody comes up with a fabulous idea and then they do all these Excel spreadsheets and they talk, and, and all of the graphs look like this, right? And the one thing that they always get wrong, usually the, great, the ideas are great, the analysis of the market is great, the analysis of the feasibility of the product is great, the one thing they always get wrong and real businesses almost always get wrong is time. It always takes longer than people think for the market to know, for the market to respond, for the market to adapt. And that's okay if all your assumptions are sound, if you have a ton of cash. And so what's so beautiful about this innovation strategy is, is that there is a cash machine behind it, which are these very high margin computers. So it's very hard to do innovation without a ton of cash. Not necessarily because the product is expensive, but the time can be expensive. But how long does it uh, take, you would say, from your history and background? Depends on the nature of the product. So physical products tend to take longer, obviously, than um, digital products because you have all the whole distribution network issue to contend with. But it also depends on how radical the innovation really is. Are you requiring consumers to change their behavior? Um, and how radically are you asking them to change their behavior? And what, might, what else might they need? So one of the reasons that the adoption of the iPod takes longer than people imagine is because they need the internet connectivity before the product is really relevant. So it depends on lots of things, many of them outside of your control. And come willpower and marketing dollars won't always do it. And sometimes they will. I mean, it's really interesting, for example, you know, if you have a lot of time to spare, which most people don't, <laughs> looking at the app store and looking at the speed with which those products come and go. You know, huge launch and the company and the app just vanishes because the take up just wasn't fast enough. And there's a cost to providing it. Is it that the take up wasn't fast enough or that the innovators didn't stay long enough? 
great question. At what point do you just need to hold your ground and be really firm and focused? And at what point are you just being stubborn and deaf? Yeah, I mean, it could be the market just doesn't like your product. And there were plenty of market analysts who in this period of time were saying, is this an innovation? Big deal, Jobs is back, we have colored, colored computers, really. And now we have an MP3 player that's cute, really. This is not disruptive, this is not innovation in Clayton Christensen's terms. It's the same way of doing something we've done before. It's just a bloody Walkman, it's just smaller, right? So, so in essence, when Jobs came back, it was really the iPhone that was the innovative product that everyone has said was. Well, we will, that's a great cliffhanger. We will come back. We will come back to that. But there's a really beautiful quote. I did a huge, as you can probably tell, I did a huge piece of research into this for a book that I never wrote. Um, it's a beautiful quote about here from Jobs, saying, you may think the iPod isn't very innovative, but if you think of the computing power inside it, and you start to think that it isn't an MP3 player, it's a computer, then it gets kind of interesting. Let's get some coffee.